I'm your host, John DeLynn. Yeah, I'm so very excited to have you with us for another episode of Mormon Stories Podcast. It is March 8th, March 16th, 2018. Uh, we're streaming live from the Mormon Stories offices in Salt Lake City. And we are so very excited to, uh, to be profiling today this book that we intended to profile last year. But uh, focusing on Greg Prince's story never got around to actually talking about the book. So the book is Leonard Arrington and the Writing of Mormon History. And the guest, who is no stranger to Mormon Stories Podcast, is the prolific and wise uh, Dr. Greg Prince. Welcome back to Mormon Stories, Greg Prince. Thank you. It's really good to have you. Um, please share, uh, right now, please share this uh, interview on your Facebook pages. Let everyone know this live interview is happening. We do these interviews live because we think it's fun, it's interactive, we're able to get questions and comments, and we hope that those of you who are joining us live will please start sharing questions and comments from this book. Um, before we actually launch into the episode itself, let me just take a moment to uh, make a few announcements as we always do. Uh, the mormonstories.org website has been renovated. Check it out. We're really proud of the enhancements. Um, there are several events coming up that we always like to let people know about. We were so excited to have Tara, a Westover author of Educated, um, here on Mormon Stories Podcast just a couple days ago. We have a live event with her March 29th um, here in Salt Lake City at, um, at the First Unitarian Building uh, in downtown Salt Lake City. So please sign up for that. You can find that event um, on the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page, or you can go to mormonstories.org slash events, and if the event isn't there, it will be soon, but you can actually sign up for that event. Um, we have uh, workshops and retreats coming up to support people who are experiencing a faith crisis or transition. Uh, we're having a retreat in Salt Lake City, June 8th through 10th. Um, we're going to Houston, July 13th through 15th, thanks to the support of Sam Young, and we're doing Idaho Falls, August 10th through 12th. We're doing our Bahamas cruise October 24th through 28th. And then finally, we have uh, interest in Boise, Idaho. We have interest in um, other areas throughout the United States. I've even had some people express an interest in coming back to Washington, D.C. So if you are interested in having us bring, oh, and we want to do either South Jordan, kind of West Jordan, Harriman area. If any of you are interested in attending a workshop or retreat, please email us at mormonstories at gmail.com and request it and we'll make sure that happens. These events save lives, they save marriages, and they're all about helping people navigate those tricky waters of a transition. So please check it out. Um, all right, so uh, uh, also those of you who really want to support Mormon Stories Podcast, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, you can go to the top right hand corner of mormonstories.org, uh, click on the donate button, 10, 15, 20, $100 a month, whatever you can afford is what keeps us in business. So we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Your donations are tax deductible in the United States. And we rely on your support to keep the nonprofit alive. Nonprofits are expensive and they require a ton of work. And so our staff keeps super busy. But please support us financially if you can right now. Um, otherwise, there are other ways you can support us. You can like uh, the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. You can write a positive review on the Mormon Stories Podcast Facebook page. You can share these interviews with other people, and then you can follow us on Instagram or on uh, Twitter, and you can give us a positive review on iTunes. Those are all different ways that you can support what we do. And uh, some of you may get tired of these announcements, but it's the way that we pay the bills. And so we just appreciate everyone who takes the time to support us in any way that, that they can. So without any further ado, um, I am so delighted to be talking about this book. This is a big book. It's a sturdy book, it's a heavy book, um, but it's a great book. And I read Adventures of a Church Historian, which is uh, my understanding, it's Leonard Arrington's uh, autobiography. I read that probably 10 years ago, uh, more, and felt like I kind of had put Leonard Arrington to rest. And Greg Prince, you've resurrected Leonard Arrington for me. Why'd you do that? <laughs> what were you thinking? I thought I had come to peace with everything. <laughs> You were looking too peaceful. <laughs> well, this is a really important book. And uh, I've been immersing myself in it the past couple days. And we're just so thrilled to have you back on Mormon Stories. 
Um, this is going to be a multi-part interview. We'll probably go four hours. We're going to break for lunch. So expect sort of a one and a half hour interview now. Then we're going to break for lunch. And then we're going to come back and do some more Leonard Arrington along with some Q&A. Why did we need this book if Leonard Arrington had already written his own autobiography? He was very measured in his autobiography. He was looking, as autobiographies tend to do, at his own life, but not reaching broadly enough to cover a lot of the other things that had been going on at the same time. He was in the center of a lot of drama, but the ripples from that center went out quite a ways, and they just weren't really the subject of the autobiography. Plus, he was a very measured person in terms of how much of what he felt he let out. Uh, he was a real gentleman. He didn't want to make waves, and yet some of the things that he thought that he experienced and that he didn't put into the autobiography are an important part of what the history was. So it was a logical thing to go the next step. The book was really precipitated after a lecture that I gave in the Logan Tabernacle on David O. McKay. After the lecture, a woman came up to me and introduced herself. She says, I'm Susan Arrington Madsen. Can we have breakfast tomorrow? And it was at that breakfast that she essentially said that my brothers and I like the McKay book. Would you do Dad's biography? So I really didn't go looking for this one. And they clearly felt that his autobiography was not sufficient to tell the entire story. So they gave me access prematurely, compared to other scholars, to his diaries. And uh, his papers were already open access by that point, but the diaries weren't. And Susan, in particular, was very helpful in arranging some of the interviews that I think both in the McKay book and in the Arrington book gave a third dimension to the story. The data points in written history are essential, but it's the recollections, the reflections of the players that come across in an oral history that I think really flesh it out and that generally don't make it to the written record. All right. Well, that, that gives us a good background. Now, I, I have to say that after the David O. McKay book, I thought, and we should mention Greg Prince has several books he's written. The first one is on priesthood. Tell us the name of that title again. That is Power from on High, the Development of Mormon Priesthood. And it's really an important book that I think isn't as well known and well read as it should be. T talk really quickly about just one sentence, what that book tries to do. What that book did was to go back to the primary documents and reconstruct the story of priesthood through the lifetime of Joseph Smith. It's not really built on the foundation of other books because other people went in the wrong direction by misreading early accounts. So I just basically went back to the primary documents and retold the story on the basis of those. It's a compelling story, and if you do it that way, you don't need to hide anything. Maybe the story isn't the one that you wanted to hear, but it holds up. Yeah, holds up to what? <laughs> holds up to anything you want to put against it. Okay. It holds up to scrutiny. It, it takes into account the data points, even the inconvenient data points. Um, and then, of course, Greg Prince was our first interview on Mormon Stories, where we discussed his David O. McKay book and the Rise of Modern Mormonism, which is a must-read for anyone who wants to understand 20th and even 21st century Mormonism. Um, but I thought you were going to do a biography on Paul Dunn. What happened to that? What happened to that was that after his death, which was unexpected, uh, his wife cooled on the project, and after her death, one of the daughters called me and said, we'd just rather that you didn't go forward with that. So I have no desire to go against the wishes of the family. The primary documents of that eventually will be in my papers and will have public access. So, so it's safe. Some, some aspiring Mormon historian can write that book someday based on... If they wish to. I, I think that the message that Paul Dunn had is as fresh and as relevant today as when he gave it. He spoke to my generation when we were in our formative years, and we've never forgotten it. Well, we'll have to look forward to learning more about that someday. All right. Well, let's dig into this book. Um, 
let's begin by just talking about, um, you know, whatever you think is important to know about his formative years that would have led him to ultimately become church historian. What do we need to know about his early years? I think one of the most important things that he wouldn't have been able to appreciate at the time was that he grew up outside the Zion Curtain. His father had a farm in Twin Falls, Idaho. Uh, his father later was a bishop, but he certainly did not grow up with a lot of Mormon influence. Mormons were a small minority in Twin Falls, Idaho, and I think that helped him because he grew up as a minority, really as an outsider looking into the rest of the society of that era. And so it allowed him to see his own faith through a different set of eyes than people who had been nurtured only within the Mormon sphere of influence. It was really important to him. He never went to a church school. He went to the University of Idaho for his undergraduate work then went to University of North Carolina. Uh, he served in World War II in Northern Africa and then in Italy. So he had a lot of experiences that were way outside of the typical Mormon experience of that time and never lived within Mormon society until he took his first job as a professor at Utah State University in 1946. So he was an Aggie, sort of. As a professor. As a professor, <laughs> yes. Yes. And he was there from 1946 until he was called to be the church historian in 1972. So what um, were his early years? And, and I've, I've read the book, but I'm asking all these questions as if I have it. Um, what, uh, what made him interested? Did he intend to be a Mormon historian? Did, what was no. his main fields of study? No. His interest initially was in agriculture because he was on a farm. He didn't like the field crops. He enjoyed working with chickens. But he at least looked at agricultural science as a major and was disappointed in the direction that it went because it wasn't really teaching people there to be modern farmers. What caught his attention was economics. And that's what he got his doctorate degree in at University of North Carolina. The brand of economics that he went into was economic history. So it was a bit of anomaly for him later on because that's not where the field of economics went. It went into econometrics with a lot of mathematics. But he was never trained formally as a historian. So you frequently will hear, well, he was the only church historian who was a professional historian. Really, that's not accurate um, because he was not trained in history. He was trained in economics and did his dissertation on the economic history of the Mormons in the Great Basin. Right. Um, something that I probably didn't plug adequately for those who uh, are thinking to join us for these multiple hours is, you know, today within Mormonism, we've got this issue where people are learning about the troubling history for the first time. They are struggling to reconcile it all. Many are feeling like they've uh, been deceived or lied to. And then we've got these essays that have come out that are attempts for the church to kind of come clean along with the publishing of Joseph Smith Ruffstone Rolling and the Joseph Smith Papers Project. But there is this massive history that goes back multiple decades of all the groundwork that got laid to make all of this possible, to make dialogue possible, Sunstone possible, Mormon Stories podcast possible, um, and the essays possible and Richard Bushman and all these sorts of things. And so I just want you to know you're in for a really, really powerful ride um, because as you learn about the story of Leonard Arrington, you're going you're gonna to understand all the foundational blocks that make modern Mormonism sort of what it is today. And it's really sickening, but inspiring, but enlightening, but uh, difficult. So... I didn't give that intro adequate um, preparation. So, uh, so we've got Leonard Arrington growing up in Idaho, um, eventually ending up at Utah State. How did he move from being someone who focused on agricultural economic history to Mormon history? How did he make that transition? I mean, he wrote about it in his dissertation. Yes. Part of it was his association with George Ellsworth. 
Ellsworth was on the history faculty at Utah State University, and it was from the Ellsworth side of the table a love-hate relationship. Ellsworth became his mentor. He taught him how to write. He looked at Leonard's dissertation, which became Great Basin Kingdom, but he said, Leonard, this thing's unreadable. You have to learn to write as a historian, and he tutored Leonard, and Leonard paid attention. The problem for Ellsworth was that the student outshone the teacher, and this became a bone of contention. Ellsworth primarily, I think, was responsible for Leonard never having been allowed to teach a history course while he was at Utah State University, which is really an astounding thing that here you have a man who became the preeminent Mormon historian of the 20th century not being allowed to teach a course in that subject in the university where he was on the faculty for over two decades. So all of his coursework was in economics, and very little of that had to do with the economics of Mormonism. But his own interest in history, I think, was piqued in part because of Ellsworth's influence on him in getting him to rewrite his dissertation, to make it readable, to publish it, and the acclaim that Great Basin Kingdom received and continues to receive more than a half century after its initial publication certainly was a catalyst for Leonard to move more deeply into Mormon history. So... Um how did the church start uh, becoming aware of Leonard Arrington as someone who might become a candidate for what became the church historian? Much of that had to do with when he was at uh, Huntington Library working on the reworking of his dissertation that later became published as Great Basin Kingdom. But he was approached by uh, Alfred Knopf the founder of that publishing house, and asked to do a survey history of Mormonism, the type that had not been commissioned previously by a non-Mormon press. So he had approached the First Presidency uh, in the 1960s and got permission through Eldon Tanner to basically look at any of the Mormon manuscript material that he wished to do in preparation for this history for Knopf. Now that history was delayed it didn't really come out until after he became the church historian, but I think that's what raised his profile among the church leadership, particularly Eldon Tanner. And my hunch is that Tanner was the one in the first presidency who put forth the name of Leonard when they were thinking about reorganizing not just the church historian's office, but really the entire bureaucracy of the church. That was a process that began shortly after the death of David O. McKay in 1970 and was pushed by Harold B. Lee, who was one counselor in the first presidency, Tanner being the second counselor, and then in 1972, Lee became the president of the church. Um, you, as, as we talk about the church sort of becoming uh, aware that they had a history problem, Maybe, maybe talk about how the church had approached history, maybe from the early 1900s uh, through the mid-1960s, specifically with, with uh, Joseph Fielding Smith. Talk about that kind of background. I think you have to go back even further from the earliest days of the church through almost the middle of the 20th century. The history of Mormonism was almost completely polarized. On the one pole, you had the apologists who were trying to prove through their publications that this was the one and only true church on the face of the earth. And on the opposite extreme, you had those who were trying to prove just the opposite. Very little fell anywhere in between those two extremes. Going well You in, call that polemics in the book? Is that yes, the word you use? absolutely. Tell it, us what that word means. Polarized history. Okay that you are sorting through and cherry-picking elements of the story so that you can burnish the image that you want to be the accepted image Is of the Is that church. a no-no <laughs> in history? Well, it, it, at that time, that's the way history was written. Mm -hmm. Not it, just it, in Mormonism? Not history? just in Mormonism, no. Okay. no. You go back and read history written before the 20th century, and you see that most of it is of that same genre. Now, we still have a lot of that today. 
you still have that type of spin, particularly in the political realm, going on day by day. And I think the current White House is a, a very poignant example of that type of cherry picking. But nonetheless, as we got into the middle of the 20th century, the rules of historiography were changing. And the idea that history should tell what the data points say was fairly new, but it was coming into vogue. And this is where Leonard came into play. Economics is very much a database science. And so his telling of the history, I think to an extent that went well beyond any of his colleagues prior to that, was a database telling of history. That's why I appreciated it, because as a that's how I have come at it right. as well. I'm a scientist. I've had nearly 50 years of a career in experimental science, and that's what science should be doing, is that you do the right experiments, you gather the data, you verify the authenticity of the data, and then the data inform what the story is, not the reverse. This is where Leonard, I think, really established Mormon history on a different level than it had been before. And he, more than any other Mormon historian that I can think of, really legitimized Mormon history in the non-Mormon academic world. Talk about what type of historian Joseph Ely Smith would have been. And there's, you know, there's word that, for example, when he would have found a, a version, maybe even the very first version of Joseph Smith's first vision account in a diary, that he would have ripped that out and hid it. That, um, you know, that, that might symbolize more than any how he approached Mormon history. Can you talk about what type of historian Joseph Fielding Smith was? Yes, but again, you go back before Joseph Fielding Smith to get the right context to understand that. And I think the context for there really began at the turn of the 20th century. There was a movement in biblical scholarship that has had various names. One of the, by its detractors, was the modernist heresy. Another was the critical study of the Bible. Higher criticism was one of the terms that was used. And what this basically was, was a movement that took scientifically generated tools of scholarship. And, and really, scientific methodology is pervasive among nearly all academic disciplines. It, it was the driving force behind Protestant scholars in the late decades of the 19th century and into the 20th century to start to look at the Bible in a much more critical manner, meaning not just reading the text, but pulling apart and saying, how did we get the text? What is the history, not only of how these texts came together from oral traditions into separate manuscripts, into a cohesive corpus that we call the Bible, but what was going on around those texts uh, in the times and the geography uh, that are all subsumed in the Bible. So that really started to come to a head in the first decade of the 20th century. The and weren't they challenging or questioning the historicity of the Bible? Well, absolutely. That yes. was a, the core yes, sort for, of Yes, one of the things that, uh, that they were focusing on that was informed heavily by science was the creation narratives. The idea of the young earth that the earth was only 6,000 years old, that the creation story in Genesis represented six literal 24-hour days, well, that was accepted uncritically by many, many, perhaps even most uh, religions of the book, the Judeo-Christian traditions. And the global flood and, and the Noah's Ark story, right? Yes, yes, moving farther into Genesis, the, the what's called the primeval history, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, which really has no archaeological basis to substantiate it. But that was not appreciated at that time. These questions then were first starting to be asked around the first decade of the 20th century, and the response, particularly among the more conservative Christian traditions, which included Mormonism, was basically to freak out. <laughs> they, Is that the technical term? <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Uh, they felt that this was an existential threat to religion and to Christianity in particular. Now, it turns out, here we are more than a century later, and uh, the, that approach to biblical studies 
has greatly strengthened the role of the Bible in the world. It hasn't weakened it, but it certainly has moved in a different direction than it was at that time. But the response amongst the Mormons, I think, was typified by the church president, Joseph S. Smith, that he saw this as a threat to Mormonism's well-being. This was at the time and for the underlying reason for the dismissal of two pairs of brothers from the faculty at BYU, the uh, Petersons and the Chamberlains, largely in their case over the issue of organic evolution. But in addition to that, Smith began to write a manuscript that was published shortly after his death called Gospel Doctrine. And I see it as really the first major work of Mormon fundamentalism. And he would have been the son of Hiram, right? So he, Yes. So that's royal lineage. When royal Joseph, lineage. When Joel, Joseph F. Smith is writing, people are paying attention. Yes. He's now, a smith. He's got the blood of the smiths right. in him. And while he was alive, he chose his son, Joseph Fielding Smith, to be an apostle. Not long after Smith Sr.'s death, which was in 1918, Joseph Fielding Smith was called to be the church historian, in addition to being a member of the Quorum of the Twelfth. I believe that was in 1922, and about a year later, he published a book called Essentials in Church History. Now, Smith did not have a college degree. He did not have any... Not even a bachelor's? No. Wow. Uh, he did not have any training in historiography, and yet here he was, not only the church historian, but the director of the church historian's office, which was not a major enterprise in those years, but nonetheless, that's where the history telling of the church emanated from. Essentials in Church History is a very uncritical book, uh, but it became the standard of Mormon historiography for decades. It went through, I think, nearly 30 editions and really was the only survey history that the church uh, produced with the exception of B.H. Roberts' cent uh, centennial, what was it, uh, comprehensive history of the church. But even Roberts' history had been written prior to Essentials in Church History. He wrote that in the first decade of the century. So, so would, would this book by Joseph, and, and I'm asking you to probably remember something that might be too detailed to remember, but I'm wondering what, what things that now would vex Mormons uh, about Joseph Smith and early church history would not have been mentioned there. So, for example, would it have mentioned the seer stone in the hat? No. Would it have mentioned polyandry? No. Would it have mentioned Joseph Smith's polygamy? No. It didn't mention Joseph Smith's polygamy at all. As I recall, it did not. But Joseph Fielding Smith knew that his father, you know, and his uncle had practiced polygamy, right? Absolutely. So is he intentionally leaving this stuff out? Oh, I think he was leaving it out and trying to create uh, an image that perpetuated the legacy of his father. Now, when we talk about religious fundamentalism, what do we mean? What we mean is it's a philosophy that tries to strip the ambiguity from a religious tradition. It accepts, uh, accepts scripture uncritically, meaning that it is literal, it's inerrant, it is unchanging. Now you run into problems if you dig very deeply into that because the very nature of Scripture is that it does change over time, but religious fundamentalism doesn't want to pay any attention to that. So anything that looked like what Al Gore later called in a different context, inconvenient truth, was left out. And, and that, intentionally so. That's a pretty, f from a modern perspective, I, I know that we need to not judge these people out, you know, in a modernist context, but that probably is one of the most seminal moments in, let's just say, early 20th century Mormon history that impacts the problems that we're in today. Is kind I of think Joseph so. Smith taking, Joseph Fielding Smith taking the helm and writing that book. Yes, and then there is a linear relationship. The baton was passed to his son-in-law, Bruce McConkie. So you had three generations that carried the torch of religious fundamentalism. That's a full century. Yes. 
of, of right? I mean, I don't know when Bruce R. McConkie died, but it would have been probably in the what? It was 80s in, to 90s. So I mean, in the late 80s, I think. Yeah, yeah mid to late 80s. Mm-hmm. And it's so hard. And this is a digression. I don't know how much you talk about this in the book. I, I don't remember a ton of it, but we had Talmadge and Woodstow and Iring and all these and Roberts, frankly, all these scientific minded leaders that very much could have taken the church in a different direction. And we just had Joseph Fielding Smith outliving them, <laughs> right? Yes. And in fact, uh, one of his influential books uh, entitled Man, His Origin and Destiny had been written in the 1930s. It was the subject of a very heated debate between Smith and B.H. Roberts over the issue primarily of evolution. How did humankind come into being? Were there humans before Adam? These questions were simmering, and President Heber Grant finally said to each one of them, make your case in front of the 12, and after they did, his response was, neither of these represents the doctrine of the church. We don't choose to have a doctrine on these issues, and so put these away. But when the last of the scientists, you mentioned... uh, I think Witso and Talmadge and Joseph Merrill, all of them were card-carrying scientists, all of them had PhDs, all of them were members of the Quorum of the Twelve. The last one, I think, was Joseph Merrill, who died in 1954, and within months of when he died, Joseph Fielding Smith went out and published Man, His Origin, and Destiny, now that all of the voices of opposition had been stilled. And so that became a de facto credo, for those who were the young earth believers and the evolution deniers. And we're still paying a price for that. There was a Pew survey about six or seven years ago that showed that an astonishing 75% of the Mormons surveyed denied organic evolution. We were second only to the Jehovah's Witnesses, which which I don't consider a badge of honor. Of course. What did you read? What, what, did you learn anything about Joseph Smith's? I mean, th- that that act of of reading. So talk about that diary, that first version of the first vision account and what Joseph Fielding Smith did with it. What you know about that act? I don't know about um, did he cut any, out? any more than what you have said. I, I have never seen documentation to substantiate that. But that earliest account or let me say the the next to earliest account, the 1832, really didn't come to the forefront until the 1960s. Because it had been cut out of a journal and uh, hid. I don't think it had been cut out. It was part of a record book that the church historians, I it may have been when Leonard was church historian, but it's around that time, uh, it became known. And but, so, but it had been cut out. Of a book, of a journal. That's, I don't know. Okay, okay, okay. I don't know. I, right. can't, I can't verify that I'm part. Just, so, so, but, but, and people tie that to Joseph Fielding Smith. So, so that that kind of represents what type of historian Joseph Fielding Smith was. You also talk in the book about r- registers and how he did not manage the church historian's office in a way to where it records was, were. Kept. It was just boxes of stuff. <laughs> What's a register? What is that? Register is basically a detailed index of what you've got. Okay. And he was against those. (laughs) Uh, Whether he was against them, he certainly hadn't gotten around to doing it. It, The whole department, the church historian's office, as it was titled in those years, was run by people who had no professional training in historiography, in archival methodology. Uh, They were collecting materials. They were writing very little of what they collected. So it was mostly an archive uh, waiting to have something happen to it, but it wasn't happening as long as Joseph Fielding Smith was alive, with some exceptions, such as Leonard, who learned how to navigate the back rooms of it and probably knew a lot more about what the church had than even the church historian did. Right. And, And the reason why I keep bringing Joseph Fielding Smith up is because for me, one of the central questions not only in this book, but in sort of 20th to 21st Mormon history is, is it true that uh, the church is better off hiding and being open, hiding its history or being open and honest with its history? I think that that was was a struggle before Leonard Arrington. 
that was the struggle during Arrington's administration. And I think we're still dealing with that struggle. And I think there's a fair case to be made on both sides. But um, la last thing uh, I'd like you to talk about prior to sort of Arrington's ascension into the office of, of the church historian is talk about the role that historians like Von Brody and others, and you list four or five of them sort of in the 1940s and 50s. What were historians directed at Mormonism doing that was starting to make the church super nervous? It was that they were laying the data points out and telling the story on the basis of what the data points said. Now, when you talked about Joseph Fielding Smith hiding, I don't think that he would have considered it hiding. We do, and that's what he was doing. But I think he was acting in good faith, feeling that his mandate was to protect the it's saints. It's the watchman on the tower. It's the exact it, argument Packer yes, made. I, it is. And you could say Packer succeeded um, McConkie, right? It's we're the, we're the soldiers on the wall shooting the wolves so they don't eat the sheep. Yes. Right? Yes. So I'm not hiding. If I'm lying for the Lord, I'm protecting his flock. Yeah. Right? Yeah. I, it, you know, it's a fair question. It is. It yeah. is. Okay, but but so, it's the difficult part is to try to take yourself back and appreciate that context. This also comes to the forefront with Leonard, where you had three basic antagonists in the Quorum of the Twelve, Ezra Benson, Mark Peterson, and Boyd Packer. And yet, if you try to put yourself on their side of the table, you can see what they thought they needed to do and why they thought they needed to do it. They felt that they were protecting the saints and that that was the higher calling. Now, in the long run, that turns out not to be a very productive way of viewing the world. But in the short haul, that clearly is what they were trying to do. And I think that they felt that that was a divine mandate that they were carrying out. Yeah. So did Brody's book, so Fawn Brody was the niece of David O. McKay. Mm -hmm. Um, did her book make a ripple? What, what type of influence did it have on the brethren? What did it make them feel? I think that it, perhaps more than anything else, caused them to close ranks, to limit the access to the archives. By that time, Leonard had been back from the war. He had some good advice from John Witso on how to establish his credibility with the church historian's office. And so he gradually worked his way into getting to see some of the primary documents at the same time that Brody was being cast as a pariah. But the two works are linked conceptually in that both people were paying attention to the data and trying to tell the story. Now, Fawn, to her discredit, um, had a chip on her shoulder. In her second edition of No Man Knows My History, she acknowledged in the introduction that, well, she had had a chip, and she was a little bit more sympathetic to Joseph in the second edition than she had been in the first. But nonetheless, she had a bit of an ax to grind. Leonard, to his detriment, uh, wasn't willing to pull back the curtain on everything. He was on most issues, but there were still some areas that were on his do not contact list. We'll talk about those. But yes. but is that is that just simply Von Brody not believing? Is that what you mean when you say chip on her shoulder? She didn't believe in Joseph's divine calling? Or do you mean more than that? I think that initially she felt that he was simply a charlatan. I think by the time she got around to publishing a second edition, she had come to accept that he felt that he was a prophet, even though she may not have felt that way. And that was a significant concession on her part. Okay. And did, did that book, did No Man Knows My History, start to cause problems for the church in the 50s and 60s? I don't think that it caused much of a problem outside of the church. If anything, I think it increased the awareness of Mormonism, and probably increased a desire on the part of non-Mormon historians to consider Mormonism 
seriously because it was a magnificent biography. You can easily filter through her biases and still come up with a landmark biography that in the, what now, we're almost 75 years out, has never been out of print. Yeah. In terms of its effect on people within the church, I think if we were able to see the data points, and there's no way of collecting those, we'd probably see a process similar to what we have with the current faith crisis, that people were made aware of parts of Joseph Smith's life and ministry that were unsavory, and that because they had been raised in an environment telling them he was a flawless man, caused some of them to become unglued when they saw that indeed he had flaws. So I think what I, what I kind of hear you saying is that um, even though Fawn Brody's um, book was a little bit critical of Joseph Smith, that, um, and even though it made the brethren nervous, fearing that it was going to cause people to leave the church, that in reality it wasn't really having that effect. It wasn't having a devastating effect on, on the church and its membership. But because it was running counter to Joseph Fielding Smith's fear that if the truth got out there, it would be devastating, then it caused the brethren to get nervous. Because it did cause the brethren to get nervous. It did cause it? them to get nervous, and I think it did have a detrimental effect on some Latter-day Saints who probably walked away. But a big difference was that in 1945, we didn't have the Internet. And so any perturbation that was being caused at a local level tended to stay local because there was no ready means of mass communication. You couldn't press the button on your computer and suddenly send a message all the way around the world to a group of like-minded individuals. You write in your book, the book scandalized church members who hastened to denounce her as lacking faith in Joseph Smith's prophetic mission. Um, you also mention other other authors like Fawn Brody who had taken kind of her stances or her approach to sort of database history. Who else? Do you remember any of those names of some of the other authors? R refresh my memory and I'll comment on them. Oh, uh, I, I'll find it later. But okay. So, But what, certainly Leonard was of the same, I think, philosophical school that you tell the story according to the record once you have verified as much as you can, the faithfulness of the data points. You, you've got to at least make that initial judgment. Are these data credible or not credible? If they're credible, then they have to be part of the story. And that's the way that he assembled Great Basin Kingdom. And for the most part, it's the way that he wrote history after that. And you could tell Arrington respected Brody, right? Absolutely, he yeah, did. Yeah, he did. Okay, so... So what made the church decide they wanted to create a history department or an official a, a change? What, what led to the ascension of Leonard Arrington as church historian? Yeah, again, I think you go back for some historical context. The church did not start with a refined organization of blueprint. It started as just a loose aggregation of believers. We didn't have defined congregations uh, really until the church moved into the Great Basin. And then the structure was mostly a ground-up movement, that you had the auxiliary organizations that were the centralization of grassroots initiatives, all of them, including the Relief Society, it's that somebody out there decided that there was an unmet need, and so he or she started to do something, and it clicked, and it grew, and eventually the central church appropriated it. But that organic process of trickle up created silos over the decades. So by the time you got into the 1960s, all of these organizations had enormous autonomy, even had their own budgets, uh, the Relief Society had accumulated a fair amount of money through the projects that it had done and had total control over that money, both at the general level and at the ward levels. I can remember as a kid in the 1950s, the annual ward bazaars that would be the fundraising activities of the Relief Society, and they kept the money and distributed it the way that they felt that it should be distributed. 
But Harold B. Lee could see that the church was getting to a point in its growth and its development where that kind of balkanization was just unwieldy. The organizations were so autonomous that they chose their own curricula each year, they commissioned their own writers of their handbooks, and there was very little, if any, crosstalk between the organizations and almost no direction coming down from on high. We had essentially a, a balkanized monarchy up through the death of David O. McKay in 1970, where these organizations pretty much functioned independently, and when they reported at all, they reported directly to the First Presidency. The Quorum of the Twelve was really staff. And until McKay's death, most of their duties consisted of state conferences and speaking in general conference, period. None of the church departments reported to the Quorum of the Twelve. This was the major shift that Harold B. Lee effected, uh, first as a counselor in the First Presidency and then when he became the president shortly after that. One of the first things that he did was to bring in a consulting firm from the east part of the United States and had them do a top-to-bottom assessment of the church bureaucracy and make recommendations for how to modernize it. So the reorganization of the church historian's office into the church historical department was part of this grand reorganization that looked at the entire bureaucracy and all of these things were going on at the same time. And I have wondered if when it was presented to the Twelve, and I was not given access to any of those minutes to be able to answer that question, but whether it was like an omnibus bill in the Congress, where you have a thousand elements in it, but you don't really have a line item veto as congressman, it's just an up or down vote. I suspect that was the case, or it may have been that the later antagonist, Benson, Peterson, and Packer, just weren't paying that much attention because there was so much else going on. But nonetheless, they had to have approved of it for that reorganization to go into effect. And what that reorganization did was, for the first time, to professionalize the historical department, to bring people in not just as church historian, but other people at the level of archives who had certification from good groups so that they could come in and modernize it, make sense out of it, and take things out of the cardboard boxes and start to catalog and make them accessible in a professional manner. Was there even a little bit of a sense that, you know, these secular historians are eating our lunch and if we don't get faithful, respectable Mormon historian scholars in there, we're going to let the faithless kind of write our own story. Was there any of that impulse that you found? I think that that was more coming from the outside. It was coming from people like Leonard Arrington, like Richard Bushman, who when they had the informal access to leaders, I think were trying to impress on them that the level of scholarship that the church had produced up until then simply was not adequate moving into a modern world. And I think that that outside-in voice then came back from the inside out in the form of, we're going to reorganize this and we'll professionalize it. But certainly there had been input from the faithful historians who were LDS, even though many of them were acting outside of the church bureaucracy. Uh, I chuckled in your book when you when you said that Joseph Fielding Smith reluctantly relinquished his position as church historian when he became prophet. Is that yeah, right? Yeah. He wasn't happy uh, at first. And then Howard W. Hunter succeeded him briefly, correct? Briefly, yes. And then it was Arrington that got picked. Yes. Now, when they did this reorganization, they did something that nobody appreciated at the time and it caused them a lot of headaches, and in some circles, even today, still causes headaches. Joseph Fielding Smith, from 1922 until 1970, had been the church historian. He also had been over all of the employees in the church historian's office. 
So everything answered to him. When they did the reorganization, they created three divisions within the church historical department. One was the church library, the second was the archives, and the third was the history division. Now, the first two of those would be obvious as to what their duties would be. There still is a church history library. It's open to the public. The archives are the mostly the non-published information that is housed in the same building. The history division was given the mandate of writing the history of the church for publication. Leonard Arrington was called to be the head of the history division, so he was one of the division chiefs answering to a general authority who initially was Alvin Dyer. But the title of church historian, which in continuity with prior years, should have gone to Alvin Dyer as the administrative head of the whole history enterprise, instead went to Leonard Arrington, who was one of three division chiefs. And you can see immediately, oops, we're going to have a problem with nomenclature, because for a hundred plus years, the title church historian had meant something different than it now meant with Leonard. But people didn't understand that difference. And so in calling Leonard church historian, they created the impression that he was the manager of all of the history franchise, when in fact he was the manager of one third of that. That, that makes sense. Yeah, it does. And, and it became a real bone of contention later on because his picture was removed from the wall where the other church historians had been. And in one sense, that was a slight to him because he did have the title of church historian. But in another sense, it was historically correct because he wasn't a peer of those predecessors who had held the same title. He didn't have that administrative responsibility. Um, so given, given how Joseph Fielding Smith obviously felt and had acted uh, regarding um, church history and his fears around it, did you ever get the sense that Leonard Arrington was vetted in a very intense way where the brethren were like, oh my gosh, there's a lot at stake here. We don't want to cause people to lose their faith. So let's apply a ton of scrutiny at this guy to make sure he's going to manage this in a way to where it engrows faith and doesn't tear things down. No, I don't think that there was. How is that possible? <laughs> In part, it's because so much was going on. There were so many moving parts at the same time, not just within the history franchise. You had this entire reorganization, reorganization. Bureauc bureaucracy going on simultaneously. And so they and just took their eye off the ball? Initially, Leonard was told that he would be an assistant church historian with the assumption that it would be a continuation of the past where you would have a general authority as the church historian, and that's what Howard Hunter was when Joseph Fielding Smith became the church president. But then they kept him on hold, and he was going nuts for a period of about six months or so because he'd been told, well, you're going to be the assistant church historian, and then there was silence, and he couldn't say anything, and he was in flux in his professional career wondering what's going to happen next. What was going on was that they still hadn't decided on the final format for the church historical department. And so what emerged was that when he finally got that calling, it wasn't as assistant church historian, it was as church historian. And so I think that there just wasn't that level of vetting that you might have appreciated because so many moving parts were moving. I wonder if they ever ended up regretting that they didn't have more scrutiny, <laughs> given the way it all ended. Well, so. given the way it ended, it's certainly that there were three apostles who were very upset that this thing had happened, and they spent a lot of time in attempting to dismantle it and eventually did dismantle yeah. it. Okay, so, um, so as I remember what I read, Arrington did have a few sort of scholarly professional 
requirements or criteria for accepting the position. In other words, he wasn't just going to run some super correlated department where the brother had the final say. Did you, did you run across sort of his conditions professionally for accepting his role that were the foundation upon which yes. he was willing to lend his credibility to the enterprise? I think that he felt that the most important if you call it a concession or at least condition, that would probably be a better word, for his assuming this position was that what he and his co-workers wrote would not have to go through the correlation process before it was published. That was a big deal for him. And it was important in the short haul because correlation has forever been famous for putting its own twist on whatever came through, and the people in the correlation department didn't have the sophistication in history to be able to make those judgments. So good for him to have gotten that condition approved, but it came back and it bit him big time later on. Because by not going through the correlation process, he wasn't really protected when his antagonists came after him Nobody along the way had said, just a minute, Leonard, if you've told it this way instead of that way, you might have a better outcome. So, so it, was a, short, that it was a short-term victory and a long-term defeat. Okay. And I understand he wanted access to the archives and he wanted no final approval of what, he, what got published. Right. Yeah. Okay. And, and also, uh, implicit in it was that they could chart their own course as to what they wanted to write and that's on the front end, in addition to having that back end license to publish it without having to go through these layers of bureaucracy. Um, that worked against him as well. He never realized that the 12 had taken on a different function in the church than they had had in prior years that because of Lee's reorganization and the church becoming an effectively a constitutional monarchy with the Quorum of the Twelve now running church government and the First Presidency being head of state, that the Twelve had power that he never fully appreciated. And so rather than court their favor, that's one way of putting it, or at least trying to gain a sense of where the 12 were inclined to bless his efforts and try to bring them on board along the way to build a consensus, uh, he and his colleagues just charged off in the direction they wanted to charge off. And that really came back and bit them. So what were the major um, initiatives that he championed um, that were that he hoped maybe would have been his legacy. Let's list like, if you had to say the five either accomplishments or attempted accomplishments because some of the, these projects got scuttled. Yep. Let's, let's, let's give an overview of what, what his legacy or hoped legacy would have been. And then we'll talk about what happened with each one because each one has an interesting story. Yes. I think in retrospect, he would have said that his crowning achievement was to move the whole field of Mormon history to a different level of acceptance in the world. So MHA? Well, looking beyond MHA. Dialogue? That, that within uh, American history, Mormon history took a place that it had not occupied previously. Okay, the, 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 the non-LDS scholars. Non-LDS scholars began Mormonism. to take Mormonism seriously. Okay. And that has certainly mushroomed in the years since his death. You think that was his one of his major goals? I, th I think it was probably a, an aspiration, if not a specific stated goal. Okay. And I think in retrospect, it was one of his crowning achievements. Okay. All right. Now, he wanted to have a new survey history to replace essentials in church history. That was the one that Jim Allen and Glenn Leonard wrote, the story of the Latter-day Saints, which at its when it came out in 1976 was just a marvelous, refreshing look at church history, and it was wildly popular. But because of the politics, it became the lightning rod 
that eventually brought down the department. We can go into that subsequently. Okay, so history, history of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, the story, the of, the story of the Latter-day Saints. The idea of, of having new survey histories done of the church. Kind of another. to replace what Joseph Fielding said. Absolutely, to right? replace that as the one volume. And that was intended for church audiences, for seminary students. Okay. Another major project was the sesquicentennial history. How many volumes was that going to be? Eventually, it expanded to 16 Right. Okay. So it's going to be this multi-volume series. Multi-volume series. Most of the volumes were chronological, but some of the later ones were topical, like the Church in the Pacific, the Church in Latin America, uh, and all of those were assigned. All of the authors signed contracts with Deseret Book Company. The the expectation was that they would be published by Deseret Book and that they would be the successor to B.H. Roberts' comprehensive history of the church, which had been done in 1930. Okay, so that's the second project, and we're going to come back to each one, but what, what were some of the others? Uh, another minor project, but I think it was an important one, was task papers in LDS history, where he took people from within the department and took specific subjects and said, write a paper on this. Those were never published, but they make up an interesting and I think important corpus of literature that is still accessible. Uh, another one that turned out to have, I think, huge ramifications and certainly took on a life of its own was the oral history. That the whole genre of oral historiography really came of age in the late 1960s, early 1970s. With some money from the Moyle family, Leonard was able to institutionalize that and to really make a concerted effort to capture the oral history initially of church leaders, but then it gradually fanned out. And I think it's one of the most important historical projects of the church to this day. Uh, the last time I checked, they had something like seven or 8,000 oral histories, but that began under Leonard. And uh, much of what is in those oral histories, and I leaned on that pretty heavily for the McKay book, wasn't captured anywhere else. So it really became a crucial source of information, and kudos to him for doing that. Um, wasn't there another book that was controversial? Was it Mormon Experience? What, what I've got it written The down. Mormon Experience, not so much. So that's the one that Alfred Knopp had commissioned him to do. Eventually, Davis Bitten became a co-author on that. It came out a little bit after Story of the Latter-day Saints. Building the City of God was published about the same time as the Story of the Latter-day Saints. That caused a bit of a stir. It had words in it like communitarian, which happens to be the accurate term for describing what the Mormon social scheme was, and but to some ears it sounded a bad like... Word. Yeah. Communism. Yep. Benson didn't like that one. Didn't like that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so so maybe we should maybe we should dig into the the sesquicentennial project and then also and then put on your list though the popularizing of history, and I think that took a couple of forms. One was that he had the initial overwhelmingly positive organizational meeting of an organization called the Friends of Mormon History, but that really spooked some of the brethren and they shut that down immediately. He wanted to have regular meetings, I think akin to what later happened with the B.H. Roberts Society, where you would have lectures, you would have the public intimately involved in the dissemination of Mormon history. But the other part of that was his sponsorship of the Mormon History Association, which began before he became church historian, but his continued patronage for symposia and for scholarly journals even after he became the church historian. That, that really was an important part then and it's important legacy now. All right. So uh, the sesquicentennial project was so ambitious. Um, and many people don't realize, so as I understand it, it was sort of like almost 10 year slices. Is that kind of right? That So Bushman yep. was assigned, Bushman was assigned to Kind of Bushman early was the New history, York years. Right? It, it wasn't so much dividing into decades as into 
eras or yeah, periods. Yeah, the New York year. The, so there's the going to be a volume for the New York years, a volume for the Ohio. The Missouri, well, those overlap temporarily, right. but nonetheless, they were distinct histories. Uh, Nauvoo, the exodus establishment of the church in the great basin the missionary outreach that followed that so yeah some chronological some topical some and it would have covered how many years when when would it have ended in terms of what it was trying to cover it was supposed to come up to the present time yeah they had hoped to have that published by 1980 which was the church's sesquicentennial anniversary right and a professor might be well. You Lamontolis had been tapped to write the Latin American portion. Yes. Um, and and so what an ambitious, cool project, right? It, it was ambitious, but it was realistic. They had the firepower to do it. They had the scholars. And who are they, the names? Tell us the names of who you know. Some of the people lined up. I'm, I'm putting you on the spot uh, there. Yeah, you are. Uh, who did the Nabu one? Even Ted Lyon was that, Ted Lyon did the Nauvoo one, Ted, right? Well, he did it, and then he died before it was completed. I think Glenn Leonard finished that one later. T. Edgar? T. Edgar Lyon. Okay, okay. Yeah. Uh, Bushman did eventually publish Joseph Smith and the Beginnings of Mormonism, which, which was the New York period. Right. Um, but not as part of the series. And so that, so, so imagine all these scholars dividing up comprehensive, you know, century and a half of Mormon history they're going to do a great job. They're going to be scholarly. They're going to be honest, but but still couch things in a way to where you can maintain faith. This super ambitious and cool project. What happened? <laughs> what happened was that it became part of the target, primarily of these three apostles. Who are they? Ezra Benson, Ezra Mark Tep Peterson, Benson, Mark Peterson, and Boyd Packer. And Boyd K. Packer. But 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 Hinckley didn't like it either. He Hinkley, I, I remember reading that he was one of the people that ended up. But he came in later, came in later. on okay. the process. And I think what he began to see was that this was no longer a practical initiative to be able to sustain. So what made Benson, Peterson, and Packer nervous? What made them nervous was that for their entire lives, they had championed the burnished history. And when they saw that the writing of that history was being taken from the ecclesiastical arm and planted in the professional arm, that was a shift that they could not abide. They did not want the secularization of the sacred history as they viewed it. Now, if you look particularly at Benson and Peterson, those two men were born in the 19th century. They grew up hearing stories of persecution from the people who were actually persecuted. Some of those pioneers were still around when they were children. And so they were very much front row observers of the kind of history that they felt had been necessary to preserve the church during those years of persecution. But they didn't appreciate the times were changing. And so they were clinging tenaciously to a past that had served them well, but unappreciated by them was not going to be serving the church well as we moved into the future. And therein was the conflict. So were there, can you remember anything about any of the specific books that had caused them distress? I, I, I know that. Story of the Latter-day Saints was the well, lightning run. We'll talk about that one. But did, had they read any of the other volumes in the sesquicentennial version? Oh, they didn't read the Story of the Latter-day Saints. Okay. So this wasn't... They were reacting to highlighted photocopies of selected pages that some of their lieutenants had prepared for them to show them how awful this stuff was. So what types of things? Things like it's like what well, when I read, I, I'm putting you on the spot. So what I read was like when when the story of the seagulls was told, where the seagulls come in and eat the crickets. Yeah. What was the problem with that? Turns out it didn't work quite that way, <laughs> and that there were uh, there were several episodes of seagulls over the years, but none of them were the really transformational story that you heard about in the lore that I was raised with and that you probably were raised with as well. When you pulled back the curtains and looked at the historical record. There wasn't some epic moment like in the Ten Commandments where the 
where the seagulls swoop in and eat all the crickets and, and it, save the yeah, starving Mormons. It, it's similar to what Wesley Walters did with the first vision, where when he went back and looked at the newspaper record, he said there wasn't a Palmyra revival in 1820. And all the scholars scrambled to prove him wrong and found out he was right. So that type of troubling detail that disrupted the flawless history with which they had been raised was an existential threat to them. Uh, I think that they felt that it was an existential threat to the church as well, but I wonder how much of it was just projecting their own insecurity when they came across a history that was foreign to them. And the was, idea, for instance, that the story of the first vision changed over time, that was very disruptive to their worldview. Or that, or that early apostles may have drank alcohol, or that... Or that uh, Mormons may have been complicit in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. Right. Rather than blaming the whole thing on the natives. So it's basically all the stuff that we're confronting now. It, it's exactly they, what it is. And... If you read the story of the Latter-day Saints now, having read things that have been published in the intervening decades, you just have to smile and ask, what was the fuss? Because it's such a mild, non-confrontational, non-threatening book by today's standards, and yet at the time that it was published, it threatened the daylights out of these people. So on page 283, some of the other things you list... Uh, this, and this is story of the Latter-day Saints now, but I think similar concerns with both projects, right? Yeah. That that it that it in the bibliography it mentioned Von Brody and No Man Knows My History and had several articles from Dialogue. Yeah. So that was a problem for the brethren. Again, it didn't bring God into the picture relating to the crickets and seagulls. Oh, here's the great one. It framed the Zion's camp expedition as a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> which you know it's hard to cast zion's camp as a rousing success <laughs> because what happened in zion's camp oh well the, the whole point of zion's camp was to march to missouri and redeem zion and it was a dismal failure almost as, as a military exercise it was right? a military exercise right. absolutely and then they get there what happens well they didn't even make it all the way there <laughs> right <laughs> and they had cholera and they had other misfortunes and barely got away with their lives and sadly marched back to Kirtland. But And the saints were blamed for not being faithful. And yeah. that's, that's why it wasn't a success. Yeah. And then along the way back, why Joseph has a revelation saying, all right, go back and finish the temple and then great things will happen. Right. So, it, so it, not framing that as a success no. or, or framing it as a failure was a problem. Um, it mentioned the firing of BYU professors and, and and when it talked about them, not in a sufficiently anti-evolution way. Yes. So these books weren't anti-evolution enough. Is that right? Yeah. Um, oh, and this was fun. It did not contain the doctrinal contributions of Joseph Ely Smith. <laughs> so not enough references to that wonderful historian, I guess. Yes, and yet here we are decades later, and if you look back and say, all right, what were the doctrinal contributions of Joseph Ealing Smith? What would we answer? That we're <laughs> ceasing publication of doctrines of salvation and Mormon doctrine, that right? We, we've distanced ourselves from a lot of the things that he and his son-in-law yeah. published. And overall, it, it, the concern was that it was secularizing church history. Yes, right? as I said earlier, they, for, from the beginning, had had the writing of the sacred history assigned to the ecclesiastical arm. And now it had been transplanted from that to the professional arm, secularizing it, absolutely, because these were not ecclesiastical officers. They were trained in historiography or whatever, uh, often in secular universities, not BYU. And here now we have entrusted them with the writing of our history, and we will not abide that. That's really a simplification, but I think it, it holds that that was the fundamental driving force behind their desire to reverse that process, to dismantle the history division, to send the pro professional historians packing, and to restore order by putting the writing of the history back under the ecclesiastical arm. 
And, and I remember very distinctly from the David O. McKay book, you saying there's no black hats and there's no white hats. That's right. But when I was reading this book, I had a hard time. I wrote black hats, Benson, Packer, Peterson, Durham, Hinckley, and Stapley. And then I have white hats, David B. Haight, David O. McKay, Hubie Brown, and Howard W. Hunter. And there's this lovely quote by David. There's this lovely scene where, jo, where, where Leonard Arrington's getting a lot of grief and David B. Haight comes out and says what to him? I mean, I've got it. Do you want to read it? Well, Haight was very supportive of Leonard. Go ahead and read it. Yeah. I think you should read it. Would you want me to? Go ahead. Okay. Haight then went to the heart of Benson's issue with the book. Joseph Fielding Smith has an approach in which the Lord is responsible for all things that brought about the growth of the church. And the devil is responsible for all things that interfere with that growth. You don't have that approach, do you? I said. Well, when people experienced the influence of the Lord and said so, we have mentioned that, and the devil is the devil as well. But there are a wide variety of things that bring about certain developments, economic, political, natural, and so on, and we bring those into the account. So this is basically Arrington explaining that he takes a different approach than Joseph Fielding Smith. In a dramatic departure from Benson's criticism, David B. Haight replied, I am glad you do. I realize that some of our history is controversial, but we can't avoid that, nor do I think we can restrict our history to telling about things the Lord caused or the devil caused. We have to tell a straightforward story. I hope you will continue to do that. So we had white hats who were who were basically saying, do what is right, let the consequence follow. You had lighter shades of gray. <laughs> no, we had dark hats that were You had darker shades of gray. Trying to hide and censor and punish yeah. anyone who told yes, the truth. Yes, they were. They were, but why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's because everyone they, has reasons. There you go. And that's why it gets into the gray area. Now, there's an interesting footnote on hate that much later he became a key figure in what now is the standard book on the Mountain Meadows Massacre, the one that was published essentially by the church. Because at a critical point, there had to be buy-in from the Quorum of the Twelve. David Haight's great uncle was Isaac Haight, who was excommunicated for his role in the Mountain Meadows Massacre. And so it took a fair amount of, I think, maturity, courage on the part of Haight when the vote came up to say, yes, this is something that we need to publish because it did not make his ancestor look good. But he had enough honesty and enough appreciation of the value of honest history to say, yes, let's do this. So kudos to him on that one. Totally. Um, there's, this, there's this point in the book, two, page 24, you write, feeling powerless in the face of Benson's attack on real history, quote, real history, he saw two options for his future. Quote, shall I retain the job, assuming they don't release me, and try to write history which will be approved by correlation, or shall I resign and continue to write real history? I am not clear in my own mind as to the best course to pursue, but feel discouraged, sad, shook. It has been a, a rough few days for me since I do not care mention at all to a soul. And I see an interesting and sad parallel between that and what we're seeing in the White House today. <laughs> in that you have some fairly capable people who probably signed up with less than full disclosure of what the job was going to be. And their options have been either to sell out and completely fawn over the president or to maintain their integrity and resign. But in most cases, they did what Leonard did, which was not decide. And so it became a decision that somebody else made for them. I wish Leonard had made that decision. I, I wish that he would have, he certainly wouldn't have given in and say, all right, I'll just write what you want me to write and we'll continue to hide what you want us to hide. I wish that he had said, you know, this just isn't compatible 
with who I am and the way I see the world, so I'm resigning my position. Oh, there was this point just in the next page where he's having a meeting with Kimball and Benson, I guess, and others, and they're expressing their concern that, quote, uh, this history, and specifically the story of the Latter-day Saints, would cause young people to lose faith. It tended to degrade or demean Joseph Smith. It did not give enough emphasis to important events, such as the founding of the church. Only 16 lines and the names of the six persons not given. It had raised questions. Benson then offered his own assessment that story of the Latter-day Saints should never have been published and that it would do great damage. So he's getting all this heat in this meeting. And then it says in the meeting at this point, Leonard asked, so they, they basically say we need to now insert ecclesiastical review of the books. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they're introducing the censorship that, that, that Arrington eschewed at the beginning of his tenure, sort of. Is that true? A little different flavor because one of the things they're grappling is, okay, do we have some of the general authorities reading this stuff before it goes out? That's a little different process than turning it over to correlation. Okay. Well, as they're discussing a process that I'm sure Leonard didn't love but was wanting to save his job, it says at this point in the meeting, Leonard asked that the ecclesiastical review step never be made public. Quote, that whatever suggestions or changes were made by them would be suggested by me in my own name, this for the purpose of not diminishing our credibility as historians and raising the cry of censorship of our works. All present seem to agree to that arrangement. Now, we all love Leonard Arrington, although you, you don't pull pinches when you feel like he may have missed something, but that feels like dishonesty a little bit. He's basically saying, edit my, edit my stuff and... and insert some censorship, but let's not tell anyone that you're doing it. I think he was trying to make the best out of a not-so-good situation, situation, trying to take the bullet for his colleagues, saying, so look, in some ways uh, it's heroic. I, I'm willing to be the buffer if this is the way it has to be. Yeah. So Story of the Latter-day Saints sunk, you think that Story of the Latter-day Saints sunk the church no. history department as no. we know? What sunk the history department was that the two apostles in particular, Benson and Peterson, almost from the outset didn't want this new order. They wanted to go back to having everything under direct priesthood and control. The role of the story of the Latter-day Saints was to give them the handle that they grabbed. But it was not that they read the story of the Latter-day Saints and decided, this is awful, this is the inflection point here, we have to make changes. They'd already made up their minds. This just became the means through which they began to work their agenda. And uh, I believe it was Benson who acknowledged at one point, and Leonard had it in his Arrington, well, I've never read the book. He just read extracts of it that had been highlighted by one of his lieutenants. Right. Um. One of the questions I get more often than any other question is, do the brethren really believe the church is true? And a different version of that is, do they know all the problems with the church history? And if so, how can they continue believing? What, what this book makes it seem like is they've known for decades, not only have they known all the problems, but they've been intentionally hiding them. How do we not, how do we not loathe the brethren for the the level of censorship and hiding of our history that this book seems to uncover. There's a difference between knowing that there are problems and knowing the problems. Talk about that. I think most of them would fall in the category of, we know we have problems. But if you were to be able to sit down one-on-one -on -one and walk them through, you'd find out that their knowledge of those problems might be surprisingly shallow. I don't see that there are many in the hierarchy uh, who have a deep understanding of the data. They don't know. Even now, you're saying? Even now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when Marlon Jensen became the church historian, he told me, I did a lot of reading to get up to speed. 
Now, in his defense and in the defense of the others, that's not why they were called to be general authorities. I can't recall any of them who came from an academic position as a historian and was called to be a general authority. Hmm. So they don't come into that job unless they have had an avocation of reading deeply, which is not likely. They don't have much appreciation for the subtleties of Mormon history when they become general authorities. You know enough of them to know that once they get into those jobs, they don't have a lot of spare time. They are constantly on the move. They're traveling all over the world. They've got portfolios that they have to deal with. So if they didn't have the deep reading before they got into the, that position, it's not highly likely they're going to be able to do much deep reading when they get into it. They would probably know the basic outlines of, yeah, Houston, we have a problem. But I don't know that very many of them would be able to have an informed discussion of, so why would different versions of the first vision be a threat? That would be a discussion I would love to have with them, but I doubt that that's something that occupies their meetings. So it gets back to your question. I think that they have accepted that there have been problems without having a deep understanding of what those problems were and why they should be considered problems. But isn't it a moral failing, is it a moral failing for them to go way back in the 60s and 70s, oh my gosh, there's factual history here that if people knew it would totally cause them to question and doubt the church. So let's hide it. Like, and it wasn't just one, it was multiple. Isn't there just a fundamental dishonesty with that approach that if somebody were a person of, of real integrity, they would say, um, oh no, 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 we don't hide things. If there are problems, we're going to, you know, the primary song, do what is right, let the consequence follow. That's what we're taught. Dare to do right, dare to be true. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, say what is truth, tis the fairest gem. Like, these are the values of, of Mormonism. These are the values that we're taught. We, it's like, you know, sin number one within Mormonism is ever criticizing the brethren. And so we jump really quickly to they're really busy. They're not historians. Uh, they've got a lot going on. But aren't we, aren't we giving them a pass when we know that they knew there were major problems and then they silence it, hide it, and punish anyone who talks about it. I think that the fundamental flaw here is fear, not dishonesty. I think that the dishonesty devolves from the fear. And I wonder how much of that fear is personal. If I, whoever I am, were to go and read the gritty details, would that destroy my faith? This is a judgment that Reuben Clark made, and he was fairly candid about it, that he got to the point where he didn't like the heat, so he left the kitchen and no longer was willing to engage on an intellectual level his own faith. I think that is probably the dilemma that many of these men have faced. Either they are fearful of their own insecurity in dealing with the church if they have to factor in all those data points, or they're projecting that and they're fearful that their flock would be damaged if the flock was exposed to those data points. Now, to a certain extent in times past, when we didn't have the internet, there might be more merit to an argument like that. I think what has not been realized is how completely and permanently the internet democratized data. And we were caught off guard as a church by that and still are playing catch up, not realizing that our kids already have the data points. What they're struggling with now is 
how do you place those data points into a context that allows you to make an informed choice about your faith? And we have dropped the ball in providing that context. You know, because you are the epicenter of people coming to you saying, I am having a faith crisis. They don't know how to deal with the data. Isn't that right? They're exposed to these inconvenient truths and they freak out. If we could give them the conceptual framework in which they could place those data points, then they can make an informed choice. Okay, do I stay in the faith tradition or do I leave it? But at least I'm not freaking out. I'm making a calm decision. And it's a decision that factors in reality. We have not provided that framework for them, and that's the price that we're paying now. And that lack of providing the framework, as you say, it goes back decades. It was a conscious decision. When I was talking to Paul Dunn, he said that he and Boyd Packer were on a committee of seminary teachers in the early 1950s that was assigned to write a new curriculum about church history. And he said pretty soon it became apparent that there were only two voices in the room, his and mine. His was, we need to hide this information from these fragile minds. And he said, mine was, they'll find out sooner or later. And we need to present the information to them while we are in the room to give them that context. And he said, I lost short term, but the church lost long term. Yeah. And we had the Millers on last week talking about uh, their faith crisis and their uh, attempts to talk to Spencer Fluman and the types of uh, very liberal and progressive, uh, flexible answers Spencer's willing to give them in private. But but the reason why we felt so strongly about doing that interview is because, and this is just going back to shining a light on the moral problem of potentially failing, is people are making such massive life decisions based on their perception that the church is true. They're deciding who to marry, when to marry, what to study, how long to study, yeah. how many kids to have. And then if they stop believing, their marriage is in jeopardy. They're often ostracized by family and friends. Uh, if they're LGBT, they may be killing themselves or you know, throwing themselves into a life of sadness and misery because of how their family reacts to their um, coming out. Uh, so the stakes are just incredibly high, not to mention just all the time and money people dedicate to an enterprise when, when now we know that information was systematically withheld from them for decades so that they couldn't make an informed decision. And I, and I, I don't mean to belabor the point, but we tend to want to come up with justifications or um, kindness or empathy or understanding. And I think everyone deserves that. But can we also call it out as a as an egregious moral failing, as dishonesty? Because isn't it, a, given the stakes is all I'm saying, given the stakes of what, what, how this really impacts people's lives, isn't it just, isn't this incredibly damaging and harmful the way the church has managed the past several decades to, to hundreds of thousands of lives? My task personally, and then my hope for the book, is to try to understand why these things happened. Now, gaining that understanding does not mean condoning what happened. But I think as a first step, one ought to try to understand, and that includes trying to have an empathetic look as far as possible. But then you have to take a step back and say, okay, now what does that mean? Was this defensible at the time? By today's standards, is it defensible? Is it doing damage? Uh, I don't think that it was defensible then, and certainly even less so by today's standards. Has it done damage? We don't even know the extent of the damage because we can't keep track of who decides just to walk away. You know a lot of it anecdotally because a lot of these people will report to you. But we can't put hard numbers on it and say, well, this percentage of the church is undergoing faith crisis now. And in fact, there are some of the brethren 
who seem to be in denial that there is such a thing as a faith crisis and have said so from the pulpit. Right. But what we are seeing now in the faith crisis movement, and, and you and I were both involved in that seminal internet study a few years ago that put numbers and faces onto it, uh, it's a direct result of decisions that were made in some cases decades ago that never got fixed even when they could have been. And now the internet and its power has ripped the whole thing open and we're trying to deal with hemorrhage. Yeah. So um, just to give our listeners a sense, we are, we are not done. We still have a couple more hours with Greg Prince and there's so much to cover in this amazing book Leonard Arrington and the Writing of Mormon History. We're going to talk about Mark Hoffman. We're going to talk about the September 6th. We're going to talk about Leonard Arrington's own faith. We're going to talk about his views on Book of Mormon historicity. Um, we're going to talk about the modern church. And we're going to really dig deep into kind of where we are now, where we are now with Mormon stories, with Mormon history, with this faith crisis, with Uchtdorf being demoted in some sense, and Oaks and... Uh, Oaks being promoted into the first. We're going to talk about all that um, right after lunch. Um, but what I want to end with for this segment is sort of how Arrington was treated. Uh, we know that he was called in, um, you know, sustained in general conference as church historian. And tell us how he was released and also talk about the portraits in Durham and in what ways even Arrington himself, who gave 10 years of very passion, committed life to this enterprise, how he was treated uh, as this enterprise was scuttled. Well, well, I'll just say it briefly, and we can dig deeper after lunch, but he wasn't even sure when he was released and wrote a letter to the First Presidency saying, could you clarify this? And they wrote back and gave him a retroactive release date. <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> that 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 pretty much says what needs to be said about the dignity with which he was treated but he wasn't released in general conference so no. it was if as if they were secretly privately releasing him but not wanting to admit it yeah and then talk about durham and the portraits on the wall of, of the church well uh, later on his portrait was taken down from the wall that had the other church historians and Again, you can see that from either viewpoint. One is that he didn't ever have the same status as the others because he was not presiding over the entire historical franchise as they had done. On the other hand, he was sustained in general conference as church historian. So trying to explain that away merely as an administrative thing um, it didn't pass muster, and it created a lot of heartache. Yeah, and so here they are. All these murals of past church historians, they release him without mentioning at General Conference, and then they leave his portrait out. Yeah. And is it still, do we know if that's been fixed in any way? Did they just take them all down? I do don't know if idea? there is a wall that has portraits there anymore. I really don't know. Shouldn't we find that out? Okay, I'm going to ask some listener right now, walk all over church headquarters, find out if they have anywhere where there's a wall of church historians Tell us if that wall of portraits still exists and if Arrington's portrait has been put up. But do you know where that portrait, what, what, what floor might they go to to find that? Do you have any idea? I don't know because it was on the second floor of the church office building that housed the historical department and everything was moved over to the church library now. So I wouldn't even know where it is. So we don't know. All right. Well, that's uh, okay. a question. So... Thank you for joining us for these first two hours of my interview with Greg Prince. We're going to take a break, have lunch, enjoy lunch, and then we're going to come back for a couple more hours of really engaging, exciting stuff. I've got tough questions for Greg. Bring your questions. <laughs> we're going to ask all your questions and more. We'll probably start around 1 o'clock. So thanks for everyone joining us. Uh, Greg, thanks for everything, and we'll talk soon. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody.